my first thing was, um, why did we have this discussion about the uh, Internet of Things? It's because th there is a vision. This came from the Army Research Lab. There's a vision of this concept of an Internet of Battle Things, where you have uh, a tactical environment that is full of IoT-like devices that are generating data. Some of these are friendly. Some of these are not. Some of these are just you know, regular consumer devices. And they're looking into this concept um, you know, having a lot of sensors on the battlefield, some of them you own, some of you, uh, some of them are not. How do you, how, how are you able to uh, utilize this data in an efficient and secure manner? So that's where this idea of the, you know, Internet of Things maybe in the end can tie in there, just because, you know, it's I think it's it's it, you know from an efficiency perspective and from a security perspective, there is a, a lot that it can bring here. Uh, this, is, this is maybe what you're talking about. There is a DARPA program that is going to kick off this week that is called uh, uh, SHARE, Secure Handheld Unassured Resilient Networks uh, at the Tactical Edge. This is basically looking at specifically using NDN for providing security for communication between devices that are owned by coalition forces. They're not yours. They may be other coalition forces. And that question about certifying devices is going to come up there. I don't think we have an answer for it, but hopefully that program can trigger an answer for that. But the reason I'm high highlighting this program is that this will absolutely use NDN. Right? I mean, I, th I think if you look at the, uh, the, the broad agency announcement that they have, this was named there as a technology uh, that they want to explore. So, um, and it, it's, uh, it's, it, it's a bunch of mobile devices. Um, in a tactical environment, the way they try to do the security today is using VPNs with something like 2 to 5% loss. They're dead. That's it. It's not going to work. So they're using for something that, you're looking for something that's more robust. And they're looking for NDN to provide that robustness along with the security that come along with it. Uh, so there's not much information we have about that yet just because it hasn't started yet, but it's going to use NDN and it's going to address some of these questions about devices and, uh, and things like that. Um, so, as I said, I'm not going to go through all these slides just because I have, I think we're almost at around 6 o'clock. The only thing that I want to uh, talk about is uh, maybe a couple of things. Some of, some of the things that we haven't talked about that maybe leverage in NDN. Security, it brings a different perspective when we're talking about security, right? So the fact that you have names for data, you can now realize something like um, a, a, a data filter that relies on, that looks at the data directly by name as opposed to filtering by ports and IP addresses. Um, you could also have uh, caching policies that are geared towards the environment that you're operating in. So some of the things that we've explored with was uh, um, uh, defining caching policies um, based on the kind of link that we're connected to and the kind of data that is important to us. In a sense, a combination of quality of service and knowledge of I am on a link that has a lot of delay, right? And there are certain data that is important. If I have limited caching, I can't cache everything. So then in that sense, can I basically allocate more space for data that is more important to me, given that I don't have enough space and I know that the link that I'm, um, you know, that, that link where that data traverses has disruption. So you can play with that to provide some sense of, you know, better quality of service uh, for the data and also better disruption tolerance, assuming knowledge of the delay disruption characteristics uh, of the links that you're operating on top of. So uh, moving forward, I think we're looking at NDN as hopefully play part of future tactical networks. Um, we've seen signs of that. Just this, you know, on its own, this DARPA share program is pretty significant. It's still DARPA, but, you know, that's long term. Uh, it's um, hopefully there will be, um, uh, 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 you know, more interest there in the technology. Uh, so, so far, the, we've, what we've looked at is mostly application of NDN as something that runs uh, or interoperate along with IP. I think that makes sense from a short-term perspective to expect something like that. Uh, but that's not necessarily something that, you know, uh, is required by NDN. It can run natively uh, on top of layer two. So maybe in the future that we'll, we'll start seeing some, some more of that. Um, and so some of the things that we've been trying to explore with as where it fits in, um, something like, you know, the concept of NDN gateways uh, that, you know, lives 
within uh, uh, in areas where you know it will be needed, in areas where you know that you need some tolerance to, to disruption or, or delay. So it may fit in between certain portions within your network and, and just you know, be able to you know, take data and uh, identify it as ND, ND, uh, you know, data that you, uh, you want to be able to provide that level of service for it and, and translate it into NDN and, and you know, go back and forth. Some of the things that we're still looking at solving are things like uh, how does it operate in a ciphertext network? So if you're running anything through a HAPI, it will f all be encrypted. So then if NDN is operating by routing through names, all that will be encrypted. So how do you deal with that in a ciphertext score? So that's an open question, but similar questions existed in uh, DD, uh, the DTN world, right? Uh, because of the similar structure, it's got its own naming space. And there were some solutions to it that were introduced in, and we believe these solutions could apply in, in this environment as well. Uh, other things like event-driven applications, when data gets generated, I think a lot of you had hinted on that question, when data gets generated, how do I know that it, that it exists in the network? Um, and uh, so there are questions about data per perishability. Uh, so one of the things that we maybe haven't mentioned that much is that when data gets generated, there is a lifetime to it. And the lifetime here is sort of a hint. It's routers could basically cache this data based on that lifetime. And then they may get rid of it, but that's not guaranteed. If you, um, it's, it's, I don't think it's an absolute requirement. Um, so if you want data to exist in network but perish, right? How do you, how do you deal with that? And then the question of confidentiality, given that you have concepts like you know, multi-level security, how do you treat data uh, and, and provide different levels of security to it? I think uh, uh, Alex had talked about uh, some of that. So uh, we're seeing signs of any in, you know, sort of already moving towards uh, or you know, being evaluated in, in tactical environments. Um, and you know, this content-centric uh, mentality addresses a lot of the uh, Issues or that, that some of the, the challenges that exist in tech networks, and, and um, we, we believe it can play a role. Uh, it's it's just going to take um, it's it's just going to take its time, much like any any new technology. So I'm I'm going to end with that, um, and then I mean I, we, we can just have questions at this point. All the way in the back. So is there already or do you foresee for a whole deconfliction of an NDMA space? It's similar to what we do at DNS, like an NDM registry. Um, so maybe at least I can answer that better. Um, I think from um, if you're looking at scale, if you want to introduce this as the thin width of the hourglass, I would think you'd need something like that. But for a small, maybe more contained environment like the one we're dealing with, and you know, in, 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 that, in the evaluation we had, I don't think we need that. I mean, I think we took advantage of the fact that, uh, you know, in, in, in tactical networks in, in general, there is, there is hierarchy that exists. You could leverage that and use it as part of your naming case, but that's not the case all the time. Yeah, and the doesn't create its own space. So we basically do here as an application space, which uh, now it is a thing as space. But let me show you, let me show that issue. The rest, you don't see Whatever you want, whatever you want, whatever you want. If you start dumping a bunch of Indian traffic on the internet, then you can create your database of will. I mean, these things are crazy. Uh, I would say differently. Uh, I don't know that I'm seeing some of them for one, that's an IP specification. It doesn't say anything about how IP address can handle it. So I think the vertical architecture is separate from the name space application. That is really a bigger non problem. Okay. Yeah. I think that's usually the easy question to the easy answer to these questions. That when, when you compare the IP, a lot of these questions were not even in the specification. There were services that provided later on to be able to enable it to work. So the specification for NDN doesn't address that as well. Right. The name application really beyond the first one. So I understand. I understand. That, that, that was my question: Is do you foresee a potential future for a standard body governing global name space around the NDN? I think it would be the DNI's or DNS evolution, not a separate one. You never, the names, you don't really have a treasury start. But the first. So development tools, including the Google Play Store app or stack, does that replace 
IP or does it write on top of IP? I would think it doesn't, but how it's in so it Does it talk to ART directly? The Google Play apps, they probably run on top of other software suites. Do they write on top of IP or are they actually doing a full MDM? Uh, is so the question about the Google Play or? Well, all, all the software suites that were on the. Okay, so the second is, okay, I have two answers. So our, all our software can run on top of the, the layer two directory. Uh, there are some limitations of the platforms uh, that force us to use the IP layer to overlay. So for example, Android platform, uh, unless you root the phone, does not give you direct access yeah. to the layer two. So we're forced to like, literally use the link local IPv6 IPv6 IPv4 addresses. So, so I think it's really a platform question. We face the challenges. We don't have access directly to layer two on many of the platforms. Talk about iPhone. My favorite vendors, they don't give me the access. Yeah, but the, the technology lets you do IP or not, and the way we've used it, we ran it on top of IP sometimes, we ran it on top of layer two sometimes. I, I think in talking about systems, they have a lot of complaints. How, how much we have struggled Trying to get the global layer access, we don't have it. Yeah, we actually have a poster specifically complaining about that. Uh, you, you haven't, it was one line on one of your future challenges. QS and resource allocation, resource management, if we put this in a heterogeneous environment where you might have very narrow band links and you have some wider band links and, and how, how would you try to kind of control the way your traffic is going, where you're getting it from, what, what's, what's being done? Can, can, can you just give me a summary of what, what's being done on that environment in, in that kind of perspective for India? Is there uh, any quality of information? Well, so from, from the perspective, I don't, I don't know how much is done in the, in the academic in academia with respect to looking at quality of service and dealing with links that have different kind of bandwidth requirements and things like that. Um, I can tell you from our perspective, we have looked at names as a source of defining quality of service in the sense that based on names, we can decide how much of my cash I need to allocate for this data and what, what do I need to take out if I have full cash, I want to take out the things that are less priority. Um, in terms of how does it work when you have application or you know links that have varying degrees of um, link capacities, um, we I, I don't you know, personally we have not experimented with that. But I would think that using a combination of forwarding strategies and quality of service or, or caching strategies. You may decide how you want to, or you may decide how you want to utilize these different. Um, you have to put some extra magic into the strategy here. I think the strategy piece is is a piece that needs to be explored for these kind of environments, in the sense that you know it, it gives you the flexibility to decide what to do, um, and you know what to do will probably be different under different situations, and there might be some level of programmability that you have there, or maybe self learning, self-react, you know, reactivity kind of thing that it needs to deal with. Yeah, I think that I agree with the Tamar entirely. The NDN is a supporting tool. NDN by itself does not specify the policies, but rather it said we use names, and then you can define whatever policies you want. For the QoS, well, in previous life I was very high on QoS, uh, that did the RCP simply to try to allocate how much to what apps. But fundamentally, the, the limited resources. So therefore, it's all about how you want to make a best use out of that. And I think that there's one fundamental difference um, both Pamela and Alex emphasize. Let me repeat it one more time. It is the names. For address, it's a very little you can infer out of it other than hard code the configuration, 1.2.3.4, what does that mean to you? You know, there's really no meaning, but for names, it's expressive. It's the semantic expressiveness that allow you to define policies based on the, whatever the semantic meaning that the name provides you. Yeah, that's really the, the fundamental enabler uh, for India. 
just the other day in the dinner, people ask me, what's the big difference? You know, address is just a special form of name. I said, exactly, yes, it's just that it's expressiveness is not there. It's just a numerical number, then you don't what you don't know what that is unless you have a big mapping table to do this back and forth mapping. Yeah, and the inside, exactly what that is. So to make things way simpler. So at the MITRE booth, we have a demo of, of NDN where we're basically running um, um, running file transfer on top, uh, very similar to the same way we have file transfer using a link that you can manipulate how much capacity it has, uh, how much uh, delay it has, uh, how much uh, loss it has. You can actually just dial in and decide what you want. And uh, it will tell you how much you're able to deliver of the data that you're sending over NDN over IP versus if you're just going file transfer over um, IP. So, you know, we'd love to have you come and look at that. For, for those of you who are looking for links that are more constrained, this might be the opportunity because, you know, we could set it up to whatever you want. So, I, I may have missed this and I apologize if I did, but um, names can grow without bound pretty much. Has there been research done into name compression, name matching, any of that kind of stuff? Um, all right, so I'll, I'll also answer it from my perspective. Maybe I'll, I'll let uh, Lisha and Alex uh, uh, add more if there's more. We've looked at it in the sense that, in, in, the, in the sense of confidentiality, right? Uh, when we deal with confidentiality today, it's encryption for the data. If I encrypt the data with NDN, the name is still ex expressive. That might be a little bit of a problem. So we've looked at concepts where you can actually do name obfuscation. Uh, and and it, it, it deals, it, it does encryption to the name, but in, in, in the sense of compressing the name so it doesn't grow, uh, we have not looked at that, but I, I'll, I'll let you add. Um, I was wondering whether you're thinking about like ASCII representation of names, that's very, really long. But I tell you, everyone knows that, right? The machines don't understand ASCII, ASCII is for us. So therefore, there is like, what is the meaning of the name is and what's the representation of it? You don't have to use ASCII to represent names. You use binaries, so that can really substantially reduce the number of bits. Right. Uh, in addition, you know, I'm, I'm old enough. When the DNS was the first design, people all worried about how long the DNS name would be, and see where we are. You have three components, and that's it. And so people really engineer the names, uh, and exactly how, right? That's all yet to be. See, to see how people develop the applications so that they don't end up with the 30 components in the day. So thanks everybody for attending. Thank you very much.